Hey everybody, this is Darren Van Dam, and you are listening to the Flick Connection Podcast, episode 50, and I don't really have anything particularly special planned. However, I think it's a good show. With Endgame having just come out, we're going to talk about superhero movies, which is not a genre I talk about much. So, seize the day, this is the time we're going to talk about it. Um... And, you know, it's not because I'm trying to appeal to everybody. I think what I have to say is... I think fans of Marvel movies are not going to love what I have to say, but I don't think you're going to hate it either. I think you'll probably agree with some of my points. And people that don't really like them as well will probably at least like what I have to say, but also sort of maybe latch on to why you don't like them as well. Um, And it's not that I don't like them, but I don't really look at them the same way I look at other movies I almost don't consider them to be like other movies and I'll explain all of that Uh, but because it's the superhero episode we are going to talk about MCU movies we're going to talk about the Avengers we're going to talk about Split uh, which I've been wanting to talk about I promised it a little bit uh, last week I'm going to go in depth on Split what worked what didn't work what I wish had happened It's going to be mild spoilers, but it's not going to spoil the movie for you. Um, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to give away any key things that happen, like at the end or anything. But generally, I will be talking about sort of what happens in the movie. Um, And you'll, you'll, by the end, you'll know whether or not you want to uh, spend your time watching it. And if you have watched it, you'll, you'll probably line up with me or not. Uh, And then, because my most popular video on this podcast has been the one about the unicorn store directed by brie larson i ripped into that movie uh for good reason um i'm not going to rip into brie larson again here but because we're talking about mc movies mcu movies marvel cinematic universe movies i am going to uh i'm gonna play some clips of her interacting with her fellow uh, Avengers cast members. Um, it seems like she's a pretty. Ho- I'm not so. I'm not saying Brie Larson is a terrible person. It seems as if she might be one though. So we'll we'll get into that. Um, I don't think we're really gonna have time to do much else. If we do, I got some stuff to talk about. However, later this week, we're going to be talking Game of Thrones as well as a movie called The Headhunter. An indie movie that I watched recently that I really liked. I think Game of Thrones fans are going to love it. So stay tuned for that later this week. I think I'm going to drop that on Friday. Um, And as of this moment, the third episode of Game of Thrones is about to be projected on a giant screen off camera. But basically by the time I wrap recording, uh, it'll be time to watch episode three. I can't wait. The first two seasons have bored the shit out of me, which is why I have not talked about it. Uh, Hopefully they make up for it here. We shall see, but I'll be talking about that later this week. So let's kick off this episode, since I'm going to talk about the Brie Larson stuff and everything. Let's The first half we'll talk about Split. The second half we'll talk about Avengers and some other stuff. By the way, I have not seen Endgame. There will be no in-game spoilers. That's a big thing that's happening right now. A lot of people spoiling this movie on Twitter and whatnot. That's a dick move. I'm not going to do it. That said, I am going to tell you a little bit about Split. So, for the uninitiated, I would imagine most people know by now, but just as a quick refresher, uh, Glass is the latest movie from M. Night Shyamalan. It is connected to, it's part of the same universe as Unbreakable, which is one of my favorite M. Night Shyamalan movies, and Split, which came out just a year ago. And the big twist at the end of Split was that it's connected to Unbreakable, that they li- that, that Bruce Willis's character from Unbreakable lives in the same universe, and James McAvoy's character, the Horde from Split, is now a villain in the Unbreakable universe. Really cool stuff. So that's a major spoiler for Split, actually. But if you didn't know that by now, I mean, they've released a whole movie on the the, the that pretense. So, Glass. I was very excited to see it. I did not rush out to see it. I didn't get, you know, there wasn't going to be an opportunity for me to do the review. And typically, if I don't see a movie, as soon as it drops in order to talk about it and review it, 
there's then no point in me seeing it late because I'm not going to talk about a movie that late. However, here we are months later. It's available to rent. I've seen it. I have some thoughts. Without beating around the bush, I'm disappointed. Now, I, I'm not going to say that there's anything really terrible, terribly wrong with the movie itself other than the fact that the initial direction that M. Night chose to take is pretty flawed. And I rarely take that stance on something. I like to just look at it like, well, that's the stance the creators took. That's the story they wanted to tell. How good a job did they do at telling that story? That's very often how I'll look at things like this. However, with Split, uh, with Glass rather, I think there was too much, there was so much more promised from Unbreakable and Split for Glass to deliver on and the general direction of it was just not going to allow for that. So it was it was flawed from the get-go. And that's sort of something I'm seeing with M. Night, where I did a whole episode months back, I think when Glass came out, where I ranked his movies. And I went basically almost in chronological order. They just got worse. They just His first like three were great. And then once he started to mess up, it just got worse and worse and worse, ultimately ending up in some of the worst movies to have been made this century in terms of like big budget movies. And that's not just my opinion. Like they stopped giving him money. Like he really screwed up and, and really, you know, went from someone that was a really promising storyteller with movies like The Sixth Sense and Unbreakable to where it seemed like he he forgot how to tell a story. Stuff got really muddy and messy and sloppy and and as a storyteller he really just not just missed the mark like he fell apart like he 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 lost something major he came back with a little tiny movie that probably cost just a couple million bucks to make called the visit they didn't even market that as being directed by him it did pretty well they gave him a little bit more money to do split i don't even think they marketed that as m night until after it was doing fairly successful and then you get this you get glass which is like m night's return uh where he's he's uniting the split movie with unbreakable two of his better efforts honestly and it's just not the right direction for the next movie now that doesn't mean they can't go in the right direction from here i actually have a lot of hope for this series however um before I just get into shitting on this movie, hang on, let me get a, again, a, I, this is becoming a beer drinking podcast. Maybe that'll be a theme, but honestly, I record these a lot on Sunday and I drink beer on Sunday. And for those of you interested, this is from Tin Barrel Brewing Company, not a sponsor, Cucumber Sour. Like I said recently, I've really... Summertime, I'm getting into these sours. And this one is sour. It's got a light cucumber flavor, but it's still... It's a little too sweet, but it still feels like you're drinking a beer. So, uh, moving on to Split. Let me t just tell you about the few things that I really liked about it. One, the same thing I liked about Split. James McAvoy is really incredible. He's, he's in a unique space to the point where, like... I don't want... I, like... I almost hate that he's wrapped up in all these X-Men movies. Not that he's not good in them, but he's way underutilized. He is very, very good at playing not just eccentric characters, but at really sort of playing like really fleshed out characters in terms of the um, ter in terms of their performance, the way they behave. He gets a lot of uh, mannerisms and facial tics and 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 they're very rich characters and not just in split even though every he plays a bunch of characters in split some of them for a very short period of time they're all good same with glass his performance is one of the strong suits but like his kind of crazy spy character in atomic blonde was great there's a really great movie called filth he stars in and he's been like an accredited, like recognized actor for a long time. But just in recent years, I think he's really come into his own. And this is this multiple personality uh, thing that he's got with with these M Night movies is great for him. I I, I really really like it, and it he shines pretty bright in this movie. I always love Samuel L. Jackson, and not just because I I love him. Like I just like with the Unicorn Store review. 
He had shitty lines to read. It was stupid dialogue. And he still breathed some life into that role. He's really great. In this, another thing that's wrong with it, he's underutilized. You don't see him much. And when you do see him, he's almost catatonic. So you don't get that. And then I know I'm going to be kind of all over the place. I'm going to talk about a couple of more things that I really liked. But his mother, the char- Mr. Glass, his character's mother had way too big of a role in this movie. If you remember in Unbreakable, she only existed in flashbacks. So it's play- her, his mother is played by an actress younger than Samuel L. Jackson, yet they've aged her, and it, it's clear as day. And she didn't really add anything to the story. I kind of get what M. Night's trying to do with the, the ancillary characters, but it doesn't work in Glass. I think it's a major part of where he's going with it, which may work, but it doesn't work here. I, I saw her way too much and was way too aware of the fact that it was a young, attractive actress that they aged by, like, 50 years. I, I'm being facetious. But, I mean, like, they aged her by, like, 35, 40 years. I'm not stretching it that much. So I didn't like that. You know, Sarah Paulson... Uh, her character was good, but basically the problem... I'm, I'm going to just jump into the stuff I didn't like, I guess. Even though the start of the movie was good. The first, you know, 20 minutes or so I thought was really cool. It rehashed some of the stuff from Split, but it got you into it. You get to see Bruce Willis actually, like, going after bad guys, which he did, barely got into with Unbreakable, so we kind of got that element but then, and they give this away in the trailers, trailers, the poster. They're all captured and they're all put in an insane asylum. And they're trying to convince them that they're not um, superheroes or supervillains. Some of the stuff I did like was there was cool stuff where like they had these flashing lights for the Horde, for Bruce Willis's cell. They had these high pressure hoses that would basically just beat him into submission. Um, not a great way to convince people that they're not super powerful if you have to have all these extra measures. But it was a cool element that felt fairly realistic. That's the tricky part about this universe is you're you're establishing the, this comic book folklore with these characters, yet it has to be pretty grounded. Like, fairly close to like the dark night where it feels like it can almost happen in our world um and it, it this movie didn't break that which is good because that you, that needs to be a constant if this series is going to work but the problem the general problem is you've now contained all your principal characters in this not just in an insane asylum because crazy shit could go on in there but they're all in their separate rooms and they remain that way for too long that's as far as I'm going to get into spoilers, but that's a major problem for me is not just that they couldn't get out. and There's just a, a, a more epic thing to ha- be told and to have happened, and you've reduced this, this crazy thing that you sort of built out over two movies already, two movies to build this up, which is fine. But on the third, that should be the breakout where now there's a evil villain in the world and the good guy has to stop him and you kind of get that but it's also very very contained to the point that it was a disappointment and i thought that that did not work and that was a direction from the beginning that was a choice and i think maybe kind of what we have here could be wrong is that m night was on a hiatus after he did after earth with will smith a movie I know a lot of you haven't seen. It was considered one of the worst movies of the year when it came out. He did The Last Airbender. Two major, major flops, meaning they lost money. Uh, studios did not want to give him money anymore, despite all of his previous successes. He had been in decline, so he was done. But he wrote The Visit about some kids that go visit their grandparents that may or may not be their grandparents, and there's creepy stuff, and it's found footage, which means you can shoot it for cheap. It didn't require any major, you know, acting talent, uh, uh, you know, star power to bring in, which cost money. Um, it was a cheap movie to make. So, yeah, uh, yeah, we'll give M. Night that much movie to shoot this kind, of, that much money to shoot this kind of thing. And it worked out. He probably already had Split written. That worked out. I'm, based on what I'm seeing, I'm guessing he maybe had a concept 
for Glass, but he probably didn't have it written. And with the success of Split, they're like, hey, we'll, we'll give you the money you need. You got to go ahead and film this thing. We need it, you know, in a year. And they kind of rush stuff. And that happens a lot. That's part of the problem with Star Wars lately. And I know that for a fact because there's been... Um, they've had screenwriters, good, very good screenwriters that have needed on record. They need more time to write the, the, the last Jedi, um, or the force awakens rather. They, they, they had someone that was really going to need like a cut, said they needed a couple of years. They're like, nope, you got eight months and they had to go with somebody else and it's rushed. I feel like glass is rushed and it's a lesser movie as a result um, and it's, it's sad because it's ultimately a, a missed opportunity. Like, I didn't care that much about the characters, even though they've been established in two movies before. Again, they're all separated. Bruce Willis, I felt like he was barely on camera. I felt like Samuel L. Jackson was barely on camera. Um, so I'm not, like, connecting with these characters at a time when it matters. Um, and then locking them all up just, like, halted the story. It just seized it up. And you're just like, uh, what are we doing? Why are we? Why do we stop? We've stopped, and and the payoff wasn't worth the 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 price you pay for for sort of stopping the story. And then there's just dumb elements in it. M Night's a goofball, man. Like he 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 gets the he needs help. He needs a co-writer that can at least guide him because like you know. One of the ancillary characters overhearing on a radio take him to the west wing of the yada yada yada. Like, that's how you're going to tell the story is someone just overheard on the radio where another character was taken. It's just dopey, you know? And then there was, like, a scene where M. Night is in a store with, like, Bruce Willis's son, and he's ordering stuff, like, cameras, and it does it's just as, like... It went on too long. It was, do again, his lines were dopey. It's just like, why, like, if I'm going to rewatch the movie, am I going to enjoy seeing that scene again? No, I'm going to cringe when I watch it because I cringed the first time I saw it. There's some of that in there, and it's just an M. Night byproduct that kind of sucks. He really didn't have that with his first few movies, and he, I think his what happened is his rapid success with his first few movies really fucked with him and kind of messed his thought process up, which is so important for creating content like this. And again, I'm not hating on it. Like, it's a major endeavor to make something like this, but I feel like he built it up with Split and Unbreakable and then had Glass, and there was a lot of anticipation. And I don't even think he came close to meeting the expectations. And I think he, I think had he spent more time on it, and maybe had some guidance to be like, hey, should we really have all these guys locked up for the bulk of the movie? Um, it could have been rewritten in a way where they were captured, they were locked up, and, and but that was a portion of the movie and not the bulk of it. So that's kind of where I stand with with Split. I don't say I, I wouldn't say don't watch it, um, but don't have high expectations for it. Just enjoy it and hope that maybe i think it's good enough that we'll get another one i hope the next one is better that's what i hope without i i would like to say more but i don't want to spoil it all right let's move on to marvel so i don't talk about marvel but excuse me i don't talk about marvel movies much i'll go ahead and tell you why I don't view them as real movies. Now, they're well done. Not only is there good actors in them, but they give up good performances when they're on camera. But, you know, Scarlett Johansson, as much as I like her and as good as an actress as she really is, she's never really on camera that much. Robert Downey Jr., he kind of just phones it in at this point. You get a couple of scenes with him, and then it's generally his face inside the Iron Man suit, and you're getting the Iron Man performance, which is not, you know, it's not Robert Downey Jr. So, I'm getting a little sidetracked there, but I don't view them as movies. I view them more as something. I'm not saying they're like TV, 
but something between movies and TV. It's sort of a hybrid where you get the production value and the epicness of a movie, but you also get sort of like the soap opera, serial nature of a uh, TV series. And that's basically what you end up with these. And, and, and I would say most people would probably agree because my evidence for this, you know, because like this could just be my opinion and I probably wouldn't even share it. However, I feel like this is a fairly founded take because nobody's really talking about Age of Ultron. Nobody's really talking about the first Avengers movie anymore. You consume it. You anticipate it, you consume it, you shit it out, and you move on to the next one. And that's more like a series. Whereas movies done on this scale that have this epic nature to them, think, like, let's compare them to Indiana Jones. It, just because you've got, and not the fourth one, just fuck, forget it exists. You've got a, a, a trilogy that's uh, of an epic nature huge production value shoots everyone's talking about them everyone goes to see them when they come out but they're very very rewatchable all the scenes are entertaining they're fairly self-contained you don't need to know a lot about the other stories to enjoy and watch the one yet they still are able to reference each other reference other movies and just be a solid two-hour block of entertainment that is fun to watch no matter when and some of this yes is personal taste but it's not like i'm it's not like i'm the one person that loves indiana jones they're very well loved they release box sets people buy them they put them on streaming platforms people watch them they, they, they you know there's still i go to you know conventions dragon con where people dress up like everything you still see indiana jones people the the original let's just go with the two older ones avengers and age of ultron are not going to have that kind of of staying power in the future i don't think so i mean there's so many marvel movies to have come out over the years and so few if any are really talked about years after uh they come out and so you know, the Indiana Jones thing is a little bit unfair, but let's go with another something that's franchise-based that came out in the last, like, four four years. Uh, Mad Max Fury Road. That one's done in a way where I've watched it personally six or seven times. I love it every time I watch it. I discover new things when I watch it. I geek out on it when I watch it. I can't wait to watch the next one that they're going to eventually make when I watch it. And I, again, I'm not the only one. And what happens with that, th the difference is it's very, very story driven. And Pump Your Breaks, you know, the Avengers movies had this overarching story. However, the filmmaking process does not revolve around the story. The script does. And there's a difference. Mad Max everything you're seeing on camera with the action even with the action not just who's here who's doing what drives the story constantly the, you can take apart a scene where they're, they're, the, the big rig is under attack it's a great action sequence you've got guys on dirt bikes jumping you've got a, basically a monster truck chasing they're shooting but there's a bunch of like nuanced stuff that works so well. At one point, there's a harpoon that shoots through the, the steering wheel. It locks up the steering. The camera cuts between the brides and Immortan Joe and communicates stuff just with the way it's cut together. Then the steering wheel is ripped out and they can't steer. Then they have to get a giant wrench and attach it quickly in order to steer. Meanwhile, there, it's, it's just... there. The, Beat by beat, every few seconds, something else is happening that's significant, that is its own micro story that's helping to drive the overarching story. With Avengers, there's a lot of sequences where characters are just talking and they're, they're driving the story forward by talking. This is another bone to pick I have with Game of Thrones that we will talk about later in the week. Um, and it's boring. Like, yeah, they have little quips and and stuff but for the most part they're they're sort of 
not just eating up time, but they're lazily telling you the story. And now this may be because this is similar to how stories are told in comic books. However, when it comes to the cinematic experience, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, uh, talking about True Lies. That's probably an even better comparison. If, excuse me, if you listen to that episode, whereas everything that's happening on screen is entertaining and is driving the story forward. It doesn't happen with Avengers. As epic as things get and as crazy as things get, there is a lot of boring talking with little jokes at each other's expense and stuff like that. Now, another bone I have to pick with Avengers movies is this is just a byproduct of a a PG-13 movie that has mass destruction. In, again, let's talk about, even though I've seen, um, uh, fuck, what was the, (laughs) blanking on the the last one's name, the third one, um, uh, Infinity War. I'm not really talking about Infinity War because it's fairly new and in order to talk about it, I would have to ruin so much and I don't want to do that. But Avengers and uh, Age of Ultron both have these epic climaxes. In the original Avengers, uh, you know, the city's being torn apart by these giant alien centipede things that are flying around and just ripping through buildings. A um, lot of rubble, a lot of buildings getting destroyed. Uh, in Age of Ultron, a whole city like breaks loose from the earth and floats up. Again, a lot of rubble, a lot of destruction. Clearly, a lot of casualties. You're not seeing civilians die, but clearly, like Manhattan is not evacuated. Clearly, as these aliens are crushing buildings, people are dying by the hundreds. Yet you don't see it on camera because it's PG-13. The problem with that is there's no, the stakes are fairly low. And another thing that causes the stakes to be really low when you compare this to something like Indiana Jones is all of these characters are superhuman. So to get off, because again, I'm not really ragging on Avengers. Get off of it. Talk about one that I really like, Deadpool. I like it. It's fun. It's, it's different. It's got its own flavor. Part of the problem with Deadpool, though, is he's essentially immortal. Like, yes, I know he can be killed, but he's pretty okay in any battle that he gets into. And so what they have to do to up the stakes is they have to throw his girlfriend in the mix or something else. And it's just, you know, Deadpool does a good job with that problem. The Avengers movies technically really don't. Like, again, I'm not talking about Infinity War. That's a separate thing. I don't want to spoil anything there, but... The, the characters are not really in that much danger, whereas Indiana Jones, he's just a, a human. He is as fragile as anyone watching the movie and can die at any time. John McClane, he can die at any time. It, the stakes are higher. It just doesn't exist with superhero movies. Batman, he is mortal. He can die at any time. Superman basically cannot and so because the stakes are different it can make action sequences a little more boring now even though like the um I believe it was infinity war with the giant uh or no, no no it was the captain america civil war where they have the giant fight at the airport uh yeah i get that that's an epic moment in the series but everybody's okay you don't think someone's just gonna die while they're fighting each other and then that brings me to my final problem with the mcu movies is they don't fucking color correct their goddamn movies if you don't know what color correction is it's when something shot with a camera even when it's a high-end digital camera made for filming movies the actual capture of what they get is kind of flat in color and kind of gray. And what tends to happen with all other movies except for Marvel movies is they color correct and they adjust it. And that's kind of how you get like the look and feel of a movie where some are a little darker, some are a little more colorful, some have kind of a bluish color palette throughout, some have more of a, like the lights, lighting looks a little yellow. Most of that is captured through color correction. Now, a lot of it happens with the production design, the sets, 
things like that, but they do do a lot of it with color correction. And sometimes they do heavy, heavy color correction. For instance, if the visual look of Oh Brother Where Art Thou, Where Art Thou is fresh in your mind, everything's dying, all the trees are orange or dying. It's a beautiful color palette. When they film that in the south in the summer, it looks like, I, like I'm in Georgia, it looks like Ireland here. Like everything is lush green. And if you see the before and afters, they really establish this incredible look digitally. It was one of the, the reason I mention it is it's one of the first ones that did it digitally. Now they're all done digitally. Uh, but they actually used film to shoot and then converted it digitally. Really cool, super nerdy stuff. But the Avengers movies don't do it. They're raw looking and it's not a good look. I think the reason they did it is because they were going to make so many, not just the Avengers ones, but all the ones that tie them together. All the whole MCU if we don't color correct across all these projects with all these different directors and editors, because they are different, um, we can keep a consistent look. It makes sense. However, the movies are a little ugly. Now, it's not something that you really notice on the first watch, but after multiple viewings, it's like, man, this is like, it just, it, it just doesn't... It doesn't have a good flavor to me. It lacks it in the color correction. It lacks it in the stakes with the characters. There's so much lacking in them. However, they're really well produced. They're they're epic. They're incredible looking. They're the again the performances. They have an incredible cast. The performances are great. The characters individually aren't really on camera much because there's so much. And I'm just kind of honestly burned out on it, which is why I didn't really care to see Endgame. I probably will go see it, but I may even wait for a rental on it. Let me know uh, if you're on YouTube in the comments if you think I'm crazy. Uh, but that gives you an idea kind of where I stand on it. And at the same time, I really like a handful of them. I love the original Iron Man. I really like Iron Man 3. I like Thor Ragnarok. Um... Black Panther was okay. But I, well, I was getting ready to say Aquaman. I thought Aquaman was exceptional, but it's not MCU. Um, but I thought the first two Thor movies were shitty. Um, there's not a good Hulk. <laughs> you know, like, uh, I don't know. That that That's basically where I stand with it. But they can make some that I like, I'm sure. Um, oh, one more problem I have. I'm sorry. I just saw it in my notes. It ties up some of these really great actors forever. I mean, Robert Downey Jr. has done like one non-MCU movie in the last 10 years. And that's okay. Like, he's one of the better parts of it. I like that he's in it. But I don't like that we don't get another good Robert Downey Jr. movie. I also don't like that we don't get another something original like an Indiana Jones for, for this this decade or this generation because all of the, the money is being spent on MCU pumping out a lot of very similar movies that, again, they're, are lacking the stakes and everything. Um, I think that that's a disappointment. I think that that's a shame that we can't get something else. But you know what? I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not saying they should stop. I mean, as long as people are willing to go pay money to go see these things and buy all the merch, it's a viable business plan. Um, I've been thinking it was going to burn out for a while, and it has not. Um, it's it's going to keep going, you know. And I, and I again, I, I like them. I really don't want to come across as like I'm just um, contrarian or a naysayer, but... You know, I, I think there's some, uh, I think there's some legitimacy to what I'm saying. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious, I'm going to be very curious to read the comments on this episode. So, I think, I think that wraps it up. But let me get into this, Brie, I, I, that wraps it up for my thoughts on Marvel. But let's get into this Brie Larson thing. So, oh, oh. All right, so I'm going to have to edit some of this out. I'm going to put in a clip. But there's, you know, if you don't know what a press junket is, 
they do them for big movies like like in game where the principal actors will be in a hotel room sometimes I, I think they do it both ways where the actors rotate through different rooms but they'll have a whole block a whole floor of a hotel uh uh closed off and they'll have uh different rooms so each entertainment entertainment tonight the e channel the the other people with with youtube channels maybe um all the major entertainment blocks will have a room and they'll have the avengers logo in the background and the different groups of actors or pairs of actors or little groups will jump from room to room so they just get burned out it's a whole day they're doing nothing but sitting and talking to the same person a different person rather but with the same questions what was it like on set to work with each other over and over and over and over again and that's part of what they get paid for like this is when they sign up to do a movie that's going to have a press tour like this that's right that's why they get paid so much money that's it's work you know they're not acting they're on a press tour to promote the movie that needs to make you know a break a billion dollars um and so this is a clip of brie larson and jeremy renner now jeremy renner has been in the mcu for a long time as hawkeye he's in the avengers movie brie larson just jumped into the mcu with captain marvel which they apparently kind of rushed to get out before endgame so she's in endgame as well this is the two of them i'm gonna play as much as i can but i'm gonna stop it when i need to comment on it but this is them at the press junket again they're probably exhausted, tired of answering these questions. I gotta start with that caveat, but there's something definitely going on here. Just because you can't hear the guy asking the question that well on this audio, he's asking, you know, like like being a star, a celebrity at this level comes maybe comes with responsibility. Do you look at it that way? That's like verbatim what he says. And then Bree goes first. Jeremy Renner, by the way, looks incredibly irritated to begin with. And he might be because he's been doing this all day and he doesn't like doing this. But he's got his legs crossed, hands over his lap. And his body language, he's very much like turned away from Brie Larson and it gets worse. But this is her response to, do you think there's responsibility for your like celebrity status? Don't look at it with responsibility. I mean, I'm... I am committed to self-improvement and I work at being the best person that I can be and using this platform for as much good as I can. But it doesn't mean that I don't make mistakes, but I'm very comfortable with that and sure. allowing myself to learn from those mistakes. Sure. Sure. So she answered the question. I'm not necessarily hating on Brie Larson on this. She answered the question. I mean, the guy asked, do you feel like there's responsibility? She said, so I don't know why she said I make mistakes. You don't have to say that. That's kind of a goofy thing to say um but i paused it for commentary as soon as the the words have not even the the breath is still coming out of her mouth as she just finished and this is jeremy renner's this is the biggest fuck you response it's a fuck you to what she just said so he either wasn't listening because you wouldn't have he would not have responded this way if he didn't want to had he been listening to what she said I, it's just just listen and we'll talk about it allowing myself to learn from those mistakes sure. yeah I'm, I'm pretty accountable and responsible for my own life at, sure. at any rate so yeah. um celebrity is not something that i i use as any sort of platform to you know to be to be more responsible or accountable i suppose but it's there's certainly an absolute uh, blessing to um, see the joy on right. on on kids faces yeah. i mean he completely stepped on her dick like <laughs> she just talked about how she likes to she she wants to use her celebrity to make the world a better place and he immediately was like well that's fucking stupid why would i why would i do that um it, meanwhile jeremy renner is almost like he's kind of known not more so than anybody but he is somewhat known for um significant charity donations with his celebrity but not really known for kind of using it as a platform so seems like a fairly respectable guy uh but just shit i mean just shit all over her and again his body language is just sort of like repulsed by her so 
that was the more interesting part of their interaction. And then a lot of people are talking about this one with Chris Hemsworth, where it's it's Hemsworth who plays Thor, Bray Larson in the middle, and then Don Cheadle who plays War Machine, who's been in just you know a couple of Iron Man movies and you know now Avengers, but um, a, a smaller role. But anyway, they've got the three of them, and you know the Chris Hemsworth sort of does this hammy thing where he's like, oh, well, you know, she thinks she's strong, but she's not that strong. He's talking about her character. That's a bit. Like, they, there's been a lot of focus on that, and I've seen some other YouTube videos where, like, I don't know, this looks, he looks like he's pretty, pretty, he's pretty serious. He doesn't like her. He's hamming it up, and they're kind of bickering at each other. Um, here's, here's what that sounds like. But the, the Don Cheadle moment is the more telling one. For me, because I'm the strongest, so it's just kind of like a different... Oh, well, yeah, you should let her think that, but... Yeah. It's not. As you I've are. said before, it's not... It's just a fact. It's not a personal opinion. No, and no, it's no. not a reflection on what you can't do, but it is also kind of a reflection on all the... It's can't do. just that you... You're just... You're just not that strong. <laughs> <laughs> but she's really smart, and, you know... But um, should we have a fight? And she can eat bacon I feel like, like we're, we're fighting business. right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been an all-day thing. So the Hemsworth thing, he's hamming it up. They're talking about who, what character is stronger. There's like a little bit of attitude. She looks, she just, the way she addresses him, she looks like she's probably just a total bitch in real life. But they're definitely joking around. But at one point, she sort of like ribs, uh, like bumps Cheadle in the ribs with her elbow. And he looks legitimately irritated with her and like mumbles on her his breath like, what did I tell you about fucking touching me? Like, let me, well, let's watch that and then I'll come, because this is, this and the Renner thing, it look, it doesn't seem like it's a bit. It really doesn't. Because why would you want it to seem like the outgoing cast hates the newcomer as far as like a marketing decision? It, it looks like genuine irritation. So it was just kind of finding our way, but it was a good group of people to figure it out with. But, right, guys? Yeah. Isn't it fun being there for all my extra takes? I you up. <laughs> the apprenticeship. They genuinely do not seem to like each other at all. Um, and then, of course, Cheadle, you know, she, he, she ribs him, and he's like, mumbles under his breath, not where you can really hear, that where the camera can really hear. It barely make it out, like, what I tell you about touching me? Um... I don't know if Don Cheadle's like known for not being touched and she just didn't know how to respect that or if it's a bit or if she somehow has gotten under everyone's skin. Another thing she did in that interview was she talked about, that's where this is where Hemsworth seemed like he was sort of irritated with her. She's like, oh, well, I just did my own stunts because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. I didn't know we could use a stunt double. Well, guess what? There's tons of footage and pictures of her with her stunt double on Captain Marvel. She wasn't doing her own stunts. She did some of her own stunts. She's not doing them all like Tom Cruise, which is what Chris Hemsworth says. He ribs her and says, what are you, going to be the next Tom Cruise? And she's like, I'm going to be the next me. Thank you very much. Tell me that's not, that doesn't sound like a total bitch. So he calls her out. She clearly wasn't doing all her own stunts. That's clear. Um, but to pretend like you're doing them, I could tell he was sort of like, look, we all did what we we're kind of allowed to do with our insurance. Don't, don't pretend like you did some shit we didn't do. That's what it seems like is kind of going on with these weird relationship with these. And I got to be honest, this whole thing that's unfolding now with this footage... <laughs> Uh, circulating uh it it's more entertaining to me probably than than in game will ultimately be i just find it so interesting and not because i just want to hate on brie larson even though she does genuinely seem like she's probably a shitty person and um uh unlikable in in real life and uh is just a horrific horrific director um again the the brie <laughs> The, the review of Unicorn Store that I did for this channel is by far the most popular thing I've done on this show. So I felt the need to bring it up. However, I did mention last week that I felt like I owed Brie Larson an apology. I'm not going to do that. But I do feel kind of bad because looking at some of this stuff, 
it's it's gotten so big this whole thing with her not getting along with the avengers cast has gotten so big she's definitely heard of it she's definitely aware of it um she's definitely aware that people didn't like her movie uh unicorn store she's definitely aware there was a lot of flack on captain marvel she's aware of these elements um and even though she is like the most successful young actress in hollywood today all of that's gotta feel like shit it's got to be fairly alienating um i had a similar thought when if, if you've never seen the show hot ones on youtube it's where they have a celebrity and the the uh host sean evans uh they each eat hot wings 10 hot wings that get get hotter and hotter as you get towards the end and he continues to to interview them and some people really freak out from the the heat on these things scarlett johansson did one and i felt bad for her because they were talking about like pop culture things like memes and stuff and she didn't seem to she thought she knew what stuff was and she really didn't seem to know because she, she you know that level of fame if you're not aware you're basically cut off from the world all of your interactions are on movie sets with close friends and family and even that has to get difficult because once you have a lot of money the phone calls come in hey i've got a business idea i just need fifty thousand dollars you got to start cutting people off because that doesn't ever work out well um and you know she's at the level she's one of the type of celebrities that basically stays off of social media to to prevent harassment and interactions with the public are tend to be this like filtered thing where security's around pictures are being taken you're there to take a picture with people and that's it and so it's a very odd it just got me thinking about the existence the, the yes they're successful they have a lot of money they can afford to go on vacations have a nice house have all this great stuff that's all fantastic however the actual like emotional experience of being that type of person that has to be so insulated from the world has to be pretty icy and cold i i felt bad for scarlett johansson just some of the, her reaction to a couple of things she seems like a genuinely nice person um and but but she's not experiencing life the same way a lot of us are and in some respects that's awesome like she gets to do cool shit She's a badass on camera. She's well respected in the the filmmaking community. Um, smoking hot. I mean, just absolutely smoking hot. And uh, but she probably can't hold down a relationship. Can't you know really just live life the way she wants to um, anymore? And it's not like it's just her. Just, I got a glimpse behind the curtain with that Hot Ones interview. And uh, I think it's got to be that way for a lot of people, including Brie Larson. Um, and some, so the problem with Brie Larson is some of the problems that she's having with people not liking her stuff and not liking her, it's her own fault. It's a symptom of her personality and she may not be a very likable person. However, all of that is probably really exaggerated by the fact that she's on this world stage and has to make it worse. So I don't want to beat people up, even though it was really fun ripping apart Unicorn Store. Um, if you want me to do more like negative reviews like that, I will. But like I want this channel to grow. I want it to do well. But I don't want to just keep, I don't want to just do, like I want to do the stuff you want but I don't want to do the repeats of the stuff you liked just under the assumption that you'll like it. I'd rather continue to put out content based around stuff that I feel like I have something to say on. Um, and I'd rather have it grow slower and be more, um, have a more substantial, like, I guess more loyal following if I'm more true to what I want to talk about versus just pandering you know uh like last week i talked about the flat earth stuff because there's there's a movie so there's a reason it's probably and it did really well it was a popular episode it's 
probably the last time I'm going to talk about it. Like, I don't have a reason to talk about it again. Unless I have a guest and they want to talk about it. But uh, if you've got any movies coming up that you want me to review or talk about, let me know in the comments below. I'll take those under advisement. Um, this Later this week, again, we'll be doing sort of the Game of Thrones episode where I talk about the show. I talk about the Headhunter movie and probably some other movies as well. For instance, I just watched Under the Silver Lake. I've got a lot of thoughts about that one. That one is bonkers. Uh, I just don't really have time to get into it on this particular episode because that one... <laughs> I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, so the, I've got some other movies. Escape Room is one I saw recently. We'll, we'll, we'll talk some more about movies later in the week. And then uh, a, a new Netflix original movie comes out later this week called uh, Extremely, uh, Extremely Wicked, something vile and extraordinary, shockingly vile and evil. It's about... Uh, Ted Bundy it stars Zac Efron. It's a Netflix original. It drops on Friday, May 3rd. I'll be reviewing that one on the main channel. There's a link to that channel in the description below uh, for this particular episode, Whether, regardless of where you're listening to it. Go subscribe to that channel, too. There's a lot of fun stuff over there. You will never run out of good movies to watch over there. But I will keep making podcast episodes like this one as long as you keep listening. Thanks for checking this one out, and you will hear me on the next one.